This morning, I have this awesome opportunity to speak with you, and I have this great sermon on humility. It's probably the best sermon you've ever heard, um, and the only, the only thing that's wrong is that I wish more people were here to hear it, uh, but I'm glad y'all laughed, because that would have been awkward. All kidding aside, isn't it awesome to come across stories of your heroes when they show their humanity? Uh, I, I can think of different heroes of my lifetime, just, just giants, you know, sports giants, uh, people of faith that are giants that we look to and we go, wow, they're, they're just like, if I could be the best baseball player, I would want to be like them. I want to, or basketball or, you know, sports, or even there's some giants of faith. And, and one of those for me is uh, D.L. Moody, Dwight Moody. And I, I have a book of his sermons here. I, I'm, I have a problem. I collect too many books. Uh, Christian would tell you the same, uh, and my wife. But uh, he's, he's a hero of faith of mine because for one of the many reasons, he was a great expositor of the word. He, he, he just showed God in everything he did. There were times and moments in his life where the adults would frustrate him. So then he would be like, well, I'm just going to start a Bible study with teenagers. And he would just go do that. Uh, so just to see his heart to reach out to the lost, to do stuff for teenagers as well. But there's a story that we know only because of somebody else telling the story because he would have never told the story about himself. But he became so famous and known worldwide that he would host these Bible conferences and, and people around the globe would come. Uh, they, would, they would sail over to America to attend his Bible conferences. And at one of these conferences, there's a large group of men that came from Europe and stayed at the school dormitory where they were having uh, the event. And that night, as they were settling into their room, as per European custom, all these men, as they were closing their doors and getting ready for bed, they left their shoes outside of their door. Because as European custom was, is that in the night, as they were sleeping, the hall servants would come through and grab the shoes and clean them and polish them and get them ready for the people the next day. The problem was, is that they weren't in Europe. They were in America, and there were no hall servants at this dormitory. And as Dwight Moody was coming through to make, check on his guests to make sure that they had everything they needed for the night, he noticed all the shoes lined up outside the door. And he knew, because he had been to Europe, the customs of the time, and he knew that there was a problem. So he went to his ministerial students at the time who were helping him put on the conference, I'm sure some that were going to be leading some breakout sessions or, or groups during the weekend or week that they were going to be there. And he goes, hey, we have a problem. There's this need. Can someone help me? Who, who can sign up right now and help me do this? Because we want to take care of these, our guests. And one by one, they all gave excuses. Oh, I've got to get some rest tonight. I've got, I've got this paper to write. I've, I've got this class that I'm taking. You, know, you gave me the assignment. You're my professor. Whatever the case may be, it was excuse after excuse. So Moody himself returned to the dorm and he proceeded to pick up all the shoes himself and take them back to his room where by candlelight for the rest of the night he stayed up and he cleaned and polished all the shoes himself. We only know this because in the morning, in the early hours of the morning, one of his friends came by to check on him and he saw that his lamp was still on. He knocked on the door and saw him cleaning the shoes and joined to finish up the last few pairs. And he, repl- he put the shoes, Moody went back to the door and put all the shoes outside. And when, when all the guests woke up that morning and opened their door, here were their shoes, polished and clean and ready for the day. But what they didn't know was that the man that they had come to hear preach was the one who had served them. You know, we, can, we can learn a lot from these stories and, and we can learn a lot from Moody and his humility, but the truth is, is that he was only imitating an even greater form of humility that's found in Christ. And we're going to find that today in our scripture as we go to Philippians chapter 2. If you want to go ahead and start finding Philippians chapter 2, that's where we're going to be for our sermon this morning. And in here, we're going to see that Paul is going to plead with the church to be humble He's going to plead with the church to be humble, and he's going to use Jesus as his main example of humility. And what what I'm hoping that we can discover today together is that we as individuals in a church can learn how to consider others as more important than ourselves 
by looking to the ultimate example of humility found in Christ. So let's go to Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 5, and we'll go through verse 8. Love for you to follow with me along in the text. Paul says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So the first thing that we need to understand as we look at the humility of Christ is is we need to look at the ways in which Jesus showed his humility. How did Jesus show his humility? Because if he's the example that Paul is going to give, we need to first break down and understand how exactly did Jesus show his humility. And Paul gives us two ways here. First, first by becoming human. Jesus shows his humility by becoming human. It says in verse 6, Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Before baby Jesus in Bethlehem, before the manger, before the shepherds, before the wise men, and all the other animals that precious moments have told us about, Before all of that, before the creation of the world, Jesus existed as God the Son alongside God the Father. He existed in the form of God. He was God, God the Son. And Jesus shows his humility because He releases that to be able to come to earth. He left heaven where he had all the rights and privileges granted to him as the king of kings and lord of lords to take the form of a servant. Now, he doesn't leave behind his deity. It doesn't say here that he quit being God so that he could become man. No, it just says that he as God also became man. He becomes uniquely 100% God and 100% man, and he becomes the Jewish baby, the promised Messiah that's bound for a cross. Jesus left the privileges of heaven and what he would, the angels would worship him, and he left all of that to become a man. See, he deserved a throne, a kingdom, and servants, but instead he accepted humbly homelessness, persecution, and just a few fishermen as his friends. He shows us his humility by stepping out of heaven to be with us. The second way that Jesus shows his humility, as Paul mentions here, is that he died. He died. It says they take, he took the form of a servant in verse 9, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So not only did Jesus take on human flesh and walk amongst us and live a perfect life that we could never live, not only did he experience all the pains and struggles of this world right alongside us so that he could not only relate to us, but then die on our behalf he becomes obedient to the cross. This, when we think of Jesus as the King, as the Lord of Lords, this is not what he deserved. But yet, it's what he submitted himself to. He submitted himself to the will of the Father to die in our place. This is how Jesus shows his humility. Now, how does God the Father respond to Jesus' humility? Well, let's keep reading in verses 9 through 11, because we'll see what God does. 
Therefore, or whenever you see therefore, you have to ask, why is it therefore? So therefore, because Jesus humbled himself and became human, because therefore Jesus died on the cross for sins, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Jesus demonstrates his humility, and what does God do? God responds. He raises him to life, and he highly exalts him. He lifts him up, and he glorifies him. We see the glory of Jesus, the ultimate glory of Jesus. Jesus becomes the name above all names. He's the visible focus of the Godhead. As we saw in the Old Testament, if we look at the Old Testament, we see that they're worshiping Yahweh, the Father, Father God. But here in the New Testament, as Jesus lays down his life, now we we find ourselves worshiping Jesus for what he has done. Because Jesus is exalted, it also points us right back to the glory of the Father. It draws us into understanding who God is and what he's done for us. So that's the humility of Christ. That Paul, Paul is using Jesus as an example here. And, and I don't know about you, but this seems like a weird example for me. Because the last time I checked, I am no Messiah. I am not Jesus. You're not Jesus. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And yet, Paul is saying, here's the example of humility, that God would step out of heaven to be with us and die on behalf of us for for our sins. How does this serve as an example for us? How are we supposed to relate? Well, the first thing is that Paul has shown us this because Jesus actually becomes the perfect example, the ultimate example of the principle of humility that he's been teaching us about. So, those of you who like extra credit, which is all the students are like, no, nah, I'm good. Like, I've got an 82. I'm good. I don't need extra credit. All right. So I'm going to give you some verses. I'm going to go through Matthew, and I'm going to give you the verses where Jesus taught on the principle of humility. And you can just write these down and look these up later this week. Think about them. And then I'm going to give you a bonus from James, just because. Matthew seven twelve. Jesus says this. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Matthew 18, 4. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 20, 16. So the last will be first and the first last. Matthew 23, 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And here's your bonus from James, the earthly brother of Jesus. James 4, 10 says this, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. So not only, so now we get to see the full picture here that Jesus didn't just teach about being humble, but he himself actually personifies humility by stepping out of heaven and dying on the cross for us. He becomes the example. He lives it out. He shows us what it means to truly live it out in principle. And I know what you're thinking. All right, we're still not God. We're still not Jesus. We're still not dying for sin. So what does this look like in my world? How how am I supposed to live out humility? Well, it helps us understand one thing. If Jesus humbled himself in the way that he did, if he was willing to step out of heaven, if he was willing to die on the cross for us, then what's our excuse for not responding to that love by following him in obedience, by us living humbly. And I know this this is hard. This is hard, isn't it? 
but that's not an excuse. Hard isn't an excuse. It's just supposed to help us understand why is it hard? Why is this difficult for us to be humble? Why is it difficult for us to walk in humility? Well, we have to understand who we are. By nature, because of our sin, we are depraved. We are selfish. I'm going to use a dirty word. We're entitled. You know, I hear all the time about how teenagers are entitled. But the truth is, is that we all are entitled. Our only interest is ourselves and our own desires. The good news is, is that Jesus died on the cross. So we can have life, but also because he gives us a new heart. Instead of having a selfish, self-motivated, self-centered heart, he then changes our hearts to be like his, to put on the mind that he has shown us to live humbly. So because of that, I, I just want to help us think a little bit. And these, I, I wrote down three areas of, of life that many of us walk in, and then I wrote down some tough questions to get us thinking. And these are questions that I had to think myself about, so you know, don't throw things at me. But the, I, my goal is that as a, as a church body here today, that we can, we can kind of sit in this and think about how we can walk humbly according to how God has called us to live in these areas of our life. So the first area is, is our family. Could you imagine what God could do if we, if we as an individual brought humility to our marriage and our family? What if our marriages weren't about what we get out of each other, but instead about what we could give to one another? What if we sought to give ourselves and our faith away to our children instead of tirelessly trying to make them into our little trophies to serve our ego? What if we sought to mend strained family situations? You know, that one uncle or that one cousin that seems to always ruin Christmas? What if, what if we, instead of allowing them to just get what they deserve, what if instead we sought to try to mend those relationships? But what about what they did to me? What if it didn't matter? What about our work? Am I demanding that people treat me a certain way just because of my title or position? I've earned this. I'm here. I have the degree. I have the experience. I've earned their respect. I've earned what they should give to me. Am I seeking to serve or be served at work? Am I intentionally serving those who are under me? Am I, am I looking, instead of every, making sure that everybody else does all the things that I want them to do for me, am I looking for ways to intentionally invest in them, intentionally serve them? And church, am I giving my church family my very best or just what is left in the tank? Am I involved in my church just to be entertained on a Sunday and cared for when bad things happen? Or am I involved because I want to serve and I want to further the kingdom? Am I the type of person that's more likely to hold on to my rights or my preferences or, or my favorite thing in the church? Or am I more willing to volunteer or get uncomfortable for the sake of the gospel. Humility isn't easy. But as Paul says, he tells us, have this mind among yourselves, 
we must adopt the same attitudes of Jesus. The way that he saw others, the way that he gave himself for others, we must take that same route and give of ourselves as well. Because we can always go back to this. When God owed us nothing but hell, he took our place so that we could have heaven. That, I just want to read nine again and then I have an illustration and then, and then the, the band will come and we'll get to sing again. Verse 9 says again, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We can read this with two different attitudes, with two different feelings. One attitude could be one of great joy. Because we look at what Christ has done and we know that he's done that for us. And now that we have followed him and trusted in him, now we get to sit here and we get to see in scripture that this, we can be assured of what Jesus has done. And there's going to be a time when every knee is going to bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And we can have great joy about that moment. Or it could be one of great fear. Because maybe we've spent our whole lives ignoring God, ignoring the story, the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus. We spent our whole lives pushing that aside like it doesn't matter. And there will be a day when we have to bow too. And it won't be a time of joy, but it'll be of sorrow and grief. Our our preteens this weekend, they, they talked about roller coasters, and that was kind of the theme of their weekend. Am I right? Yeah? Awesome. Okay, so I thought it would be fitting to share about my first ever time riding a real roller coaster. Because they talked about getting off kiddie rides and getting on the big roller coaster. So I'll tell you about my first time riding a big, a big boy roller coaster. And it was at Astroworld. Oh, uh, Yeah. Y'all remember? Yes, I'm old enough to have gone to Astroworld, despite popular belief. I was there, um, and, and we were there. My, my family was there, and you know, I was finally able to ride the big rides. And my favorite color was green. So the roller coaster that I wanted to ride was the Viper. Yeah, I, I see some head nods. Yes, bringing it back. The Viper, you know, it was green. It had, had the tunnel with the dragon on it, the loop. Oh, man, I was all in. So me and my dad get in line for the Viper, and we're excited. It's going to be my first ever time to ride a roller coaster. And the, the line's inching forward, and I'm just excited. I was probably jumping around and hitting things and knocking over other people. I don't know what was happening. But we, we inch up, we inch up, we inch up, and all of a sudden we're on the platform right in front of the, the coaster, right? We're about to get in, and... You know, the, the gates are opening and all that fun stuff. And then all of a sudden, me and my dad are standing there and we're next. And I watch the, the cart go and it click, 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 click. And all of a sudden, I felt terrified for my life. You know, I saw, I got to see it and I was like, oh, those are screams of joy and laughter. This is going to be amazing. I saw the loop and I was like, wow, I get to go upside down. And then all of a sudden it hit me as I'm about to get on the roller coaster that, oh, this is real. This is actually happening. And I think my dad looked down at me and saw me and saw, probably saw the, all the color leave my face and was like, son, it's going to be okay. I, I, I'm going to be right there beside you. We're going to do this. You can do this. I go, okay, I'm still shaking. All of a sudden, the next one comes in, and half of it was empty, and I'm like, what happened to the other half of the people? Uh, um, and then we get, we get on the roller coaster, and, you know, we, the, the lap bar, we pull the lap bar down, you know, the, the excellent form of safety. You know, we're going to go upside down on a giant metal machine, and they give you this thing with a little pillow on it to keep you safe. And I, I strap in and, and I'm just like, I, I don't know if I could do this. I look, I look at my dad and I go, I don't know if I can do this, dad. He goes, don't worry. 
I'm right here beside you. I've got you. I won't let anything happen to you. I don't know why I believed him. I mean, he's just human. It's not, not like you'd be like, oh, I will stop the coaster myself. But I trusted him. I knew that he had me. I knew that I was safe. All of a sudden, the guy gets on. No one knows what they say. Click. Boom. Here we go. Click, 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 click. We're heading up. And as I'm looking around and I'm seeing everything, which is terrifying, and, and I, I, the fear once again sets in. I'm like, Dad, I can't do this. And he goes, here, grab my arm. And I just wrap myself around his arm. And as we get to the top, I'm like, I, I, can't, I can't keep my eyes open. I'm, I'm afraid. He goes, it's okay, I've got you. And, and as, as we were kind of nearing the, the, the tunnel to drop down, I, I bury my head on my dad's shoulder and I hold on to him. As we drop down into the first drop and into the loop, and as, as the ride goes on, I began to let go because I trusted him. I knew I was safe. And that fear turned to joy. What I was once terrified of became something that was exciting to me. If we think about this moment where every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess... It all comes down to, did we trust Jesus? Did we cling to him? Whenever we, whenever we came to the realization that things weren't how they should be, did we reach out to him and hold on to his nail-scarred hand? Did we give him our life and relinquish control of ourselves to him and know that we could then live and enjoy life around us because of what he's done for us. That's going to be the difference in how we see that. Have you done that? Have you trusted in Jesus?